Good morning, and welcome on board what is going to be an incredibly beautiful sunrise safari here in the Sabi Sands. We've got Jandre manning the camera, bringing you these beautiful views. And take a look at this as he zooms off some incredible colors and rays of bright orange sunshine. Look at that. Good morning from Africa. And we hope you are all looking forward to the adventure. Like I said, this is a spectacular, spectacular scene. And hopefully some more spectacular scenes will unfold in the next three hours as we explore Juma. We've got a bit of a different plan today, and that is that James and I are both armed with small little cameras that we are hoping to try and put down near a dwarf mongoose home, probably a termitarium that they live in. So that's a kind of little challenge that we've set for ourselves to see if we can get, it, get any cool footage with a little camera of some dwarf mongooses. So that's something we haven't done before, and we are both set out for that quest. Like most quests that we will perform out here, it will often lose traction or may vary in direction as we may find other tracks or hear alarm calls, but that is one of the goals for the morning. I'm going to be checking the southern boundary whilst looking for any dwarf mongooses. And the reason why I'm going to do that is that I'm hoping that Karula, a female leopard, is going to have come back onto Juma. Her tracks indicated that she crossed out of our property yesterday. Hey, jean look what's coming to visit us here at about 11 o'clock. It's going to be difficult to see, but there's a large, large beast making its way directly towards us. How cool is this? Morning. Wow. And I've just heard another massive branch breaking behind us. So there's another elephant here. Jason, you said you were hoping for some elephants this morning. Look at this. Absolutely beautiful. This is an a elephant bull. And there's, I'm sure, another one behind us. I can also see James's vehicle behind us. So I think he's going to be in position with the other bull that I've just heard breaking what sounded to be a massive branch. It was either that or the vehicle that James is in is making some funny noises. Well, this is my kind of a safari. You just park in one place and let the animals come strolling straight past you. Okay, well, we're going to continue on with my plan to check the southern boundary, and we're going to leave James to continue this elephant sighting with you. He does also have visuals of the other bulls, so why don't you jump onto his vehicle, and we will catch up a bit later. Good morning, good morning, everybody, and there is an elephant, obviously. Uh, my name is James, Brian is on camera. Hello, Brian. Hello, James. Show us your thumb. Oh, it's too zoomed in. Too zoomed in. Can't show you the thumb yet. Sorry about that. We will demonstrate it to you shortly. Uh, we're obviously, as Scott said, also on a live safari. Just behind him, I can see him disappearing off into the wilderness as we speak. And this is part of the same little herd of elephants that he was looking at. Now, the exciting part of the morning, of course, is that we are back on Wendy. For those of you who are regular viewers, you will know that that is the recalcitrant old bat that we call the name that we give to the recalcitrant old bat that is one of the vehicles that we're on and uh, she started today which is a positive thing uh, whether she will start again remains to be seen we hold thumbs especially in the wake of the fact that we're looking at elephants ah look there's brian's thumb now 
please do talk to us during the course of the drive. Hashtag Safari Live if you're on the tweet tweet. Questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to talk to us on the email. Otherwise, the YouTube chatty thing works as well. This, that elephant that you can see center frame there, has just pushed that tree over. But you can see that the particular tree that it's eating has been pushed over more than once. And all it does is change direction and grow the other way. There, the particular piece that's being reached for now, look, that is growing out of a horizontal trunk and was replacing and becoming the main trunk. It's now going to become not the main trunk anymore. This is amazing. Look at the foot up. Hello, Michelle in New Jersey. Um, interesting comment. You say you've missed the last two drives and you feel like you've missed a week of soap. Um, I'm slightly distressed that we are being compared with a soap opera. Um, I'll, I'm sure I'll get over it during the course of the day. Um, you can call me Ridge Forrester if you like. <laughs> That's a very poor joke. Michelle, as with most soap operas, you will catch up within seconds as to what's been going on. I'm just going to sit here for a little while watching these LEDs. We might try and get a sneak a little bit closer, just so that I can give you a view of that tree and the savagery to which it's been subjected. <laughs> Brian, that didn't sound particularly good, did it? No, not at all. No. Ease closer here because I want you to see the extent that this tree has been butchered over the last little while. And it's an amazingly resilient tree, obviously, because it's still living. It's been pushed and pulled over probably three or four times during its life. And you can see that it has survived well. And it's managed to do that because it's evolved with elephants. I'm just going to be quite quiet because we're quite close to them. You can see they're all quite young elephants. They're not particularly worried by us. You see this tree? So that, that main trunk that main trunk there that Brian is shining on. Shining on is a, what would I say, Brian? Focusing on there, that main trunk there. You can see the middle bit there is now the main trunk and didn't used to be. You can see the actual main trunk's just been snapped off. But before that, the whole reason that there are three or four trunks coming out of the ground there is because the tree has been pushed over so many times. It's just amazing to me. And all around these clearings, there are trees like this that have actually formed sort of bushes of their own because they've been pushed off over so many times and there were so many trunks coming out of the ground now. Hello, our beard. Good morning to you. And this is the most beautiful morning. You will see the sun coming up just now. And you want to know how it is that we keep elephants out of our living quarters. Well, um, largely, now this is not a facetious answer, but they, they will struggle to fit through the door where we, where we live. Um, but they also will avoid human noise. They won't want to come near a camp. If we were in a camp, and it does happen, of course, where there was a lot of green vegetation. We had gardens and obviously leafy green delicious trees for the elephants to eat. You'd find that they spend a lot more time in the camp. Um, but there isn't really that case now where we live. Then around the FC there is, but there is a fence around the FC and so they can't get really through that fence. They could if they really wanted to, but it is electrified, which means that they will get zinged. Interestingly, there are many camps around here that have a, what we call an elephant fence, which is just a fence that keeps elephants out. It's a two-strand fence that sits about mm, probably five foot or five and a half feet above the ground. And that's just to give elephants a little hook if they try and touch the fence. 
but they're so clever that sometimes they will learn how to avoid them. So I've seen an elephant figure out which was the earth wire and which was the live wire, and then pull the fence down using the earth wire. I've seen an elephant pick a piece of branch up and hit the fence down so then, without making contact with its own skin. And I've also seen them go to the pillars where the fence or the posts where the fence is attached and push those over and then step over the fence. So, I mean, they really are very clever indeed. You can just see the picture starting to lighten. It's always amazing to me how quickly the light comes on a day like this. I think it's going to be another hot day. But it certainly isn't, well, it hasn't been, I think we're over the heat hump. It hasn't been as hot as, it doesn't feel as desperately hot. And I think we're heading gently into the autumn which will still be pretty hot by most of the world's standards, but for us, very pleasant indeed. And if you were ever feeling a little bit, um, I suppose, tense or worried that all is not right with the world, a little bit of time with elephants like this can really solve that issue, especially when they're being so peaceful and confiding around us. There's something very old about them. Hello, Liz in Wisconsin. You say that you have loved elephants since you were a little kid. Well, I have loved elephants too since I was a little kid, Brian. There we go. There was just a small picture flicker. Yeah, I don't think it affected you though. So I, this, was, this is going to be happening to trees all around the reserve at this stage. Because of the drought, elephants have, reje <laughs> elephants have rejected the uh, pathetic offerings of grass that the earth is offering them up at the moment, and they are eating the trees. <clears throat> Which means that, can you imagine if the drought was to persist for the next little while? I think he's actually scratching a foot there. It's hilarious. If this drought persists, can you imagine the change in the height of the vegetation and the structure of the vegetation? There are lots and lots of elephants in the Kruger National Park area, and they will profoundly alter the shape of the vegetation. Janice, you want to know how the elephants survive during the drought. Well, at this stage of the drought, Janice, all they're doing is moving on to their winter feed. And their winter feed or dry season feed would be exactly what they're eating now, trees and leaves and bark. I haven't seen many eating bark. I think that's because some of the trees still have leaves on them, um, but they're largely eating their kind of winter forage at the moment. Now, when the winter actually does come in full force and the dry season really takes hold, they're going to struggle to find enough to eat. And I think it might be a difficult time. But we'll only know that later on, and we'll only know that after we've seen if we're going to get any late rain. And Mark Tilbury, exactly, it was just kind of what I was alluding to earlier. You were saying, do trees evolve to survive elephants? Yes, completely they do. You can see this tree is not dead. If you did that to the average pine tree that you find in North America, or perhaps some of the other trees that you get up there, if you broke them at the main trunk, I think you'd find the tree would die very quickly. Out here, there are very few trees that when pushed over don't coppice or sprout from the ground where they've been pushed over. And there are very few trees that can't handle a certain amount of ring barking or debarking, which very few trees can. And the most obvious example is the marula tree, which uh, the, you can see the trunk sticking out the back of that elephant, uh, just sort of, he's facing it now. That big tree there, thank you, Brian. That's a marula tree. And the marula tree, of course, uh, has evolved with elephants, and it has a number of adaptations to dealing with elephants, the most interesting of which I think is that the fruit doesn't ripen on the tree. The fruit ripens on the ground. And elephants love marula fruit, and so they drop the fruits onto the ground before they ripen. And that means that the elephants will not push the tree
trees over when they want to eat the fruits. It's rather a brilliant arrangement. The elephants don't eat the unripe fruit. But most of the trees out here will have some kind of adaptation to dealing with the machinations of elephants. Eric in Virginia Beach, um, you're interested in to, to know why it is that an animal might have longer front legs than back legs and is there advantage to it? Eric, I think it's purely a function, I don't think it's so much a function of the legs, but a function of the weight that has to be borne, and then a function of what those limbs are used for. So an elephant obviously has a massive head, a massive skull, and you know the trunk is also extremely heavy, and so it's got to support that mass. I think you'll find that's why the musculature and size in the front is larger than that at the back. Um, they also, of course, their back legs aren't necessarily shorter so much as hidden behind the largeness of their elephantine bottoms. So, I mean, the leg actually goes quite a long way up into that sort of back half of the elephant. But the most obvious example of an animal that has very long front legs and short back legs would be a hyena. That's an adaptation for stamina, and it's also an adaptation to the carrying. Look at this. What these elephants are looking at, Brian? I don't know. Suddenly they've turned, they've gone silent, and they've stopped feeding. And I did see some impala running around earlier. That's fascinating. Look at that. They've either heard, or smelt, or seen something. They've opened their ears out, which is a slight sign of alarm. It's not us, because they would have faced, they'll face the threat. I'm just going to move around. I wonder if something isn't chasing those impala down there. And this is another herd that they're hearing. So, Eric, as I said, the most obvious example would be a hyena or a wildebeest with their long front legs and short back legs. In the wildebeest case, an adaptation for stamina. That's not the case for an elephant, I don't think. And now they've kind of split up. One of them's gone down there, one of them's gone straight. I'm going to follow this one because I think this one in front of us here seen something he doesn't like. He's going to go and look what it is. Now, an elephant will react like that to a predator. If it smells or sees a predator, even though the predator poses absolutely no threat at all, they may well react to a predator like that. There are the impala, but they definitely don't look particularly terrified. Morning, young. Let's just stick with this little one for now. Have we caught a whiff of a leopard on the air? Brian, look at this impala hiding in the bush there. young elephant bulls, everyone, and they've probably just left the herd. Maybe they haven't quite left the herd, and there's another herd around here, and the matriarch was calling, and that's why they all perked up and listened. Now, as I said, you can see the trees around here have all been hammered in the same way that that Terminalia cerisia or silver cluster leaf has. This is a different kind of tree, and you can see it's in the same state. It's become a bush rather than a tree. Hello, Bash in Canada. That's an interesting name. I doubt it's the name your mother gave you. Uh, Bash, you want to know if an elephant 
would care about a bird's nest when they're browsing. Do they worry about bird's nest? I can say almost categorically, no, I don't think they would. Uh, I don't think that they would eat a nestling bird if it came squealing out of a tree. You know what they might avoid if there was a noise coming out of a nest of nestlings? They might avoid that, you know. They are very sensitive to sound. And, I, you know, quite apart from the inconvenience of eating a nestling bird when you happen to be a herbivore, um, I think the sound would probably put them off. So maybe, yeah. But I don't think that they would necessarily think about it. It's actually an interesting question. And we do know that elephants are, well, we think that they are pretty emotionally in tune. You know, we know that they are, I mean, the term sentient being is, um, is possibly a little bit esoteric for this time of the morning, but we probably do think that they're a lot more conscious emotionally than many other animals, and so maybe. There's Impala just running that round in the clearing in front of us there. Can't see them with the camera. I think he's just heard the sound of Wendy starting and wondered how it is that the car could possibly be sounding that dreadful after its prolonged sojourn in the hospital. So a young elephant bull, and so behavior like this wouldn't particularly terrify us. Were he to be much larger, we probably think about moving away, but all he's doing is saying hello. He's also deciding, you know, he doesn't really know what his strengths and weaknesses are at this stage. He's like a sort of 18 year old. Hello, Sharon, an interesting one that we were just chatting about. Oh, look, he's putting his trunk in his mouth. That's a kind of displacement behavior. Hi. Now, Sharon, you look into his eye. You said you wanted to know. If you look into an elephant's eye, do you get the impression that there's something there? You look in there. You tell me. Heliotropum flowers now. Shall I? I don't know if it's in the eyes, but I get a sense from him, certainly, that there's a, a conversation going on of sorts where they are... I mean, he's talking to us there. He's, showing, he's shaking his foot, and he's basically saying, I'm feeling a little awkward, but I'm quite enjoying having a little bit of a just look around, I'm a bit bored with walking around desperately trying to find enough to eat. Well, the sun has finally decided that it's going to come up over the horizon, so let's go to Scott, who has found it. Isn't this a wonderful scene? And happy that those elephants continue to entertain you and James. Jandre and I have been checking the southern boundary. So far, only tracks of two honey badgers coming into Juma, and also a fairly large herd of buffalo. So I was hoping we were going to find some lion tracks trailing the buff, but no joy. So we are just going to continue down. Just down in this dip that we're about to get into is where we saw Karula's tracks. I'm guessing it was Karula, a female leopard, crossed out of Juma yesterday morning, and I'm hoping she is going to have returned. Erlene, you've mentioned that you'd love to see a leopard this morning, and so would all of us. It's been tough going regarding the leopard viewing over the last couple of weeks. The last time we saw Karula was basically two weeks ago. It will be two weeks tomorrow. 
and that was when she was hissing at Tingana at the Juma waterhole and we were doing some moonlight late night safari testing that some of you will remember. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm Scott. You didn't get to see me earlier. You just heard me yabbering on about the beautiful sunrise. And it's a great pleasure to have you on board. I've got Jandre, like I said, on camera. Hello, Boyd in North Carolina. And I'm going to miss you guys as well. Don't you worry. Only four more drives for me, so the clock is ticking and it's approaching very rapidly, which is quite daunting. And you've kindly mentioned that you would like to see whatever's on my kind of Juma bucket list here. And I know I've mentioned the African rock python is high up there. Another high action takedown of a predator displaying its speed and agility would also be something that would be great to see. And I was chatting with Nikki about it the other day. Um, there's obviously a bit of a sensitive subject, that of kills being made um, by the predators. I'm just going to check carefully on this road here. No tracks that I can see at a glance. And it's not the, it's not the actual killing that I like to see, but it's the display of any predator's agility and stealth that is so seldom captured on film or, or just seen or experienced that that's why I enjoy the excitement of the hunt. It's not the actual killing part, though. That obviously usually gets everyone a little bit uncomfortable, varying degrees of discomfort. I guess the, the last kind of kill that was seen was with James and the Inkohuma Pride. And that was a really tough one to watch. The, the lions had really taken down the zebra, and it took quite a while for it to die. And nobody enjoys seeing that, but the precursor to that, the, the, the thrill of the stalk and the chase is what I get really excited about. So that would be another thing that I'd like to see if only captured one kill in over a year of being here. Hello to Jill Anderson, who is lucky enough to be coming here with her husband in June. That's awesome, awesome news. It's a wonderful time of year to come in June. Um, although it'll be interesting to see what state the weather is in, or sorry, the, the, the vegetation is in by then, because obviously the droughts is having quite a large impact on what's going on with the vegetation. If there's lots of snakes around at that time of the year, probably not too many. Um, but yes, we do get pythons here, we don't get any anacondas, but there's quite a large amount of different snakes that you will see out here if you are lucky enough, but it, it's fairly seldom that we actually do see them. Okay, we found some tracks here. It's not of what we were looking for, but it's of a very, very interesting nocturnal animal. These tracks and these tracks over here are the interesting claw marks and toe marks of an aardvark. This would have been a right foot. You can kind of see the three toes there. It's mainly the three toes that are clearly evident. Then the fourth and the fifth leave a small depression over there. Here's, the, if we move across, here's a left. Three to long toes in the middle for digging and the, the two side toes over there. So a rare ant bear or aardvark across this road in the wee hours of the morning. And I'll show you a quick picture of what looks like now. It's a bizarre animal, the aardvark. I'll just use this little picture on the back. It'll be the easiest. Take a look at that. That's who crossed the road there. 
<clears throat> I am actually going to do one better. Let me find the picture in the book because they do show the tracks in the book and then that way you'll be able to um, get a better idea of what exactly the tracks look like. So here we go. There you can see it's mainly those <clears throat> three toes that are evident, but you saw that the, the fourth and the fifth are also evident in these tracks here. They're just not often easy to see, and these are the predominant toes that you will see. Very good. That's one animal that <clears throat> I've never got to show you guys, so we can add that one to the bucket list, but I fear that the chances of seeing that is very slim. As we don't spend uh, time out late enough. <clears throat> All right, well, we're going to continue scouring the southern boundary to see if anything else will come into Juma, and we will be sending you back while we do that. Hello, everybody. We have just left the elephants basically to go and seek out some mongoose, uh, the dwarf variety that we will try and film with GoPro. Um, we haven't found any yet. I basically want to find some that have just come out onto their nest, or oh, onto their nest, onto their mound to rest in this rising sun. We'll chase them back inside quickly put up the GoPro and then leave and then I think they'll probably come out at some stage and investigate. Of course, whether or not my GoPro battery will last long enough for them to come out or not is another question. I'm drive a little quicker. Apparently there's a mound where they often come near Zoe's Road. Hello Jelly9. Jelly lime? Jelly lime or Jenny lime? Um, yes, I've got that bit, Nicola. I need the first bit. Is it jelly or Jenny? Oh, jelly, as in the pudding. Jelly lime. Hello, jelly lime. Again, I'm not sure that your mother gave you that name, and you want to know if this is live. Well, jelly lime, it's as live as you and me. Uh, we are live in the wilderness here in the northern eastern corner of South Africa, as evidenced by the fact that I am now speaking to you probably 40 seconds after you sent your question through. So thank you for taking the time to tune in. Thank you especially for um, getting hold of us and sending us a question. I'm just hearing a squirrel alarm call, so let's just stop quickly. Squirrels are notorious liars. There are also some guinea fowl alarming. Let's just go along that road there. It's a road called Ingwe Alley, which means Leopard Alley. There may be a leopard lying there, perhaps, with any luck. In which case, the mongoose will have to take a very back seat. So, Jelly Lime, uh, thank you for talking to us, and please do feel comfortable to ask us any questions you like, and next time you talk to us, tell us where you're watching from. It would be very nice to know. Jelly Lime. It's made me want some pudding. Are you hungry, Brian? Mm, Probably much. peckish for some lime jelly. My mother always eat, drinks a lime milkshake, right? There's a fact you didn't know about me. Hello, Tagger6. Um, interesting question from you. Do plant-eating animals live longer than the carnivores out here? Yes, they do, actually. I mean, of, for animals of equivalent size, they most certainly live longer. Those guinea fowl are going crazy. Something's going on here. I just hear them going... <laughs> so, Tagar 6, the most long-lived animal out here, of course, is the elephant. Would live to about 55 or 60 years, sometimes 65 if it's a really old fellow. Just keep an eye out here, everyone. And the longest living carnivore would be a lion, living only to maybe, well, lion and leopard, living to an absolute outside maximum of 16 to 17 years. North. 
going on here. There's the guinea fowl. Is it? Up there in the tree. This main tree, this is the blob there, Brian. Oh, it's seen something. She's been distressed by some form of predator, and that's why it's sitting in the tree there. Where does it look like it's looking? Towards the drainage line. So there's a dry stream to the right-hand side of your picture, in fact, straight over the top of that guinea fowl. And I wonder if there isn't a predator there. Go a little bit forward and then turn on and come slowly back. Hello, <laughs> Ainsel's Aegis. Ainsel's Aegis, you too are on YouTube and possibly a new viewer. Wonderful to have you along. You say, do we ever come across the human animal? You haven't seen any cars or people. Uh, no, we're on a private game zone in the middle of the Kruger Park. So, no, we might come across the odd game drive from one of the lodges. Just excuse me not looking you in the eye, Ainsel. We're just having a look to see if we can't find whatever that guinea fowl has been distressed by. Um, but we might come across the odd game drive from the other lodges around the area. So cheetah planes, we sometimes see their cars, Arethusa, Juma, but that is seldom. So quite often it's just us out here. And, uh, you'll find Scott and I on our own, and then Jamie and Brent, when they're not holidaying. Guinea fowl stop shouting. Some more, there's some ox peckers calling to the south there. The guinea fowl's just landed on the ground in front of us. Which means that whatever was irritating it, is obviously not close by. It's almost like they're saying, are you all right? Looked like a terrible ordeal you went through. What did you see? Leopard. I saw a leopard. But it ran away. We're OK, everyone. Let's just fossick about in this piece of dung. That'll be nice. We'll all be comforted by uh, eating some termites out of this dung. Doesn't that look like a nice breakfast, Brian? Mm, mm. It's very tasty. Tasty buffalo dung for breakfast. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Sand blaster. You want to know the animal's alarm call at the vehicles? No, they don't sand blaster. They tend to be fairly immune to us at this stage. Uh, they might move away if you get a little bit closer or move to within what they consider a safe distance. But otherwise, no, they're not. They won't alarm call at us. They can sometimes alarm call at people on foot. But I've never had a car alarm call at a vehicle. They just don't associate the vehicle with a threat or certainly with a predator. There's the peaceful sound now of the helmeted guinea fowl as it fossicks about looking for invertebrates in the, the dun. Hello, Vasha in Michigan. We're looking at some guinea fowl. A smaller thing calling to the side of us is a white-browed scrub robin going. And you say the American robin is your favorite bird. And you want to know if we get thrushes here. We get robins, and we do get two species of thrush here. One is the olive thrush, and the other is the ground scraper thrush. Those are the two main ones that we get here. I don't see them commonly. Um, I want to move on, everyone, just in case there is a leopard walking along the drainage line here. So we're going to leave these guinea fowl to their dung. This is actually quite an interesting sighting, though. Just quickly, quickly. Sorry, Brian. You can see them there digging in the dung. Now, they don't eat dung, but they will be looking for the termites that are eating the dung and the other animals, maybe dung beetles, dung beetle larvae, 
Might go, not going to find many dung beetles here at the moment. This is actually really good sighting of them. So lots of animals, of course, eat dung. Lots of invertebrates, and that's what the guinea fowls will be looking to try and get. We're going to hand you back to Scott. He's in the Far East at the moment. Let's see what exotic oriental things he can find there. And we'll continue here and try and find what that guinea fowl was yelling at. You may have just heard and got a glimpse of that parrot flying past. Well then, Jandre. That was a brown-headed parrot. And... It's the only parrot we get in this part of the Sabi Sands. There are two others that we get further north of us in the Kruger National Park. And I know James did just mention that you may be heading across to see what exotic creatures we may find, and I guess that is one of the more exotic type birds of the region, even though they are here throughout the year and they do belong here. So we are now on the eastern boundary, heading north up towards the Buffalo Water Hole. Eventually, if we make it that far, there was a couple of big male lions off to the east, off to our right last night. Maybe they would have come into Juma. There's been no sign of the Inkohuma ladies for a while, so hopefully they'll also come back from wherever they've been hiding out. Interesting, you saw another set of aardvark tracks coming into Juma. They were bigger than the last ones. Um, so yeah, that's just interesting fact that there are two aardvark safely nestled in their burrows underground, probably fast asleep already. So interesting that some of these animals work the night shift. But Brooks, you mentioned that you'd love to see some honey badgers, as would I. Sadly, the Sabi Sands is just not the, the best place to see honey badgers. And out of all the time we've spent out here, we've only managed to get them on camera a handful of times. My, my sum total of honey badger sightings is uno, one, moja in Kiswahili. Um, one sighting of the honey badgers, but in other parts of Africa, you may get better visuals of them and other of the interesting kind of more nocturnal animals, the aardvark, serval, caracal, but the Sabu Sands is, is not the place to do that, sadly. But who knows, maybe we'll get lucky. I think James has been the luckiest out of all of us regarding honey badger sightings. I think he's got two or three under the belt already. So good thing that he's also out this morning. Hello, Karen in Oregon. And yes, you are correct. We will be doing a fireside chat the last half an hour of the safari tomorrow night. Not on Sunday. Uh, tomorrow will be Nikki and my last day here at Wild Earth, so we're just gonna be doing the fireside chat one night earlier to finish off with a bang. I know a lot of you love the fireside chats, as do we. And I think it's gonna be slightly different, a few slightly different uh, things or kind of focuses of the fire set chat, obviously, because it's a farewell chat, I guess. So possibly there's going to be one or two clips uh, of my history and Nikki's history here at Juma. There's some hyena tracks coming into Juma down from down this road. But that's not what we're looking for. Hyena tracks litter all the roads in the morning. They cover huge distances every night. 
So it's one animal that you don't really track down. Unless, of course, you're James Henry and you're looking for their new den site, then you track them and you find them like he did. He is the one that we can thank for finding the new hyena den and the old hyena den before that. And I think even the one before that, no, I think that might have been Steph, but James could have been there with him. That may have been a collaboration. Sharon, Brian, and Michelle, you guys are expressing your interests in going to the hyena den for some cuteness. I'm sure that is a possibility. Um, I know that I'm quite far from there now, but I'm going to continue my border patrol. And if we don't find anything interesting to follow up on, then I will end up close to uh, where the, the hyena den is. So I'll be happily to pop my head in there unless we get distracted along the way. I'm not too sure what James's plans are at the moment. Susan in Los Angeles, you would like to know if we ever see crested guinea fowl in this area. And no, sadly we do not. They are seriously funny looking birds, the crested guinea fowl. Did you say, did I say crested Franklin? I meant crested guinea fowl if I did. Um, so we get the helmeted guinea fowl here, and I'm going to show you in the book the differences between the two. The helmeted is the one on the right with the blue head and that large helmet. It was made out of keratin, almost like a horn. And then look at this thing's funny little wig. <laughs> they are hilarious. And when they walk, they kind of jiggle and bubble from side to side. Hilarious. Tina Turner wigs. Um, they like quite forested areas and you find them usually far north in the Kruger. That's where I've seen them in an area called the Perfiri Triangle, um, which are quite thick, well-forested areas is, is where they like to live, along big rivers as well. You get another uh, kind of vulture up in, in East Africa called the Vulturine guinea fowl. Do yourself a favor and check that one out. It's got incredibly pretty hackles along its breast and throat and strange bluish head. Gabby, you'd like to know if we have any form of uh, turkeys in South Africa, and no, no turkeys here, sadly. The most turkey-like bird, I guess, is probably the ground, southern ground hornbill, this individual over here. Um, but it isn't a turkey, it's a hornbill, but it's, I guess, a, a similar-looking bird that one could get confused with. But no turkeys in South Africa. Unless they're, of course, the domesticated ones. What you guys need to do is ask Brian to make his turkey noise. That is going to make you laugh. He has got the turkey down. So that's something you can look forward to when you go back onto James's vehicle. Um, I'm very happy that Brian is James's cameraman this morning. 
he can make the best turkey noise I think anyone on the planet is capable of. <laughs> so I hope he's in the mood to speak some turkey to you this morning. Thank you. Excuse me. Okay, well, we will be sending you back to James. Goodbye. Go for Brian. Some turkey noise. <laughs> For the first time I heard Brian do the turkey noise, I was off the vehicle because I was trying to do an, an introduction to the safari from off the vehicle. I said, Brian, just make like a natural sound when we live. Just go make a or a or a and I, I went behind the termite mound. And the next thing I heard was that. <laughs> exactly. And I was in hysterics for the next 20 minutes. I was unable to speak. And that was thanks to Brian's gobbling noise. There. Is that a mongoose there? Or was it just a, a hole? We're trying to find mongoose, everybody. No, it's just a hole. I'm sure that's the little den that they have. Let's just see if we can't hear them making their morning calls. That's not a mongoose, that's me. Of course, on every other day, you can find mongoose running around with a great uh, profusion, as many as termites. But on the one day you actually seek them out, they are nowhere to be seen. A little bit like Schrodinger's cat. You don't know what that means, do you, Brian? I do. You do. Michigan, we've just been looking at that termite mound, and you want to know how long it takes him to make a three-meter-high termite mound. Well, it depends. I know, I know people often hate to get depends answers, but it does really depend on how wide it is. So sometimes they just build straight up into the sky, and that would take them. I've seen a three-meter one actually go up in about a month, say. But to make a really wide one like that one there, and that was about probably two meters tall, two and a half meters tall, uh, that would be, I mean, they're probably looking at about 30 or 40, maybe 50 years to make a mound that large. Just going to ease down here onto the clearing, the parlor clearings. Let's see if we can't find some mongoose here. That's a remarkable achievement that you have, um, Cecilia. You say you can make the me a mean call of a <laughs> of a seal. Brian, what does a seal do? Cecilia, please send us a voice note if you can. What is this? It goes, I've forgotten what a seal does, Brian. I'm not sure either. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Don't they done? Depends on the seal, though. I suppose it does depend on the seal species and whether it is playing with the ball or not. You cannot find a mongoose for love nor money. We will turn around here. I think that herd of buffalo came through here at some stage yesterday evening. I know that, of course, by the Quite astonishing amount of dung has been deposited all over the ground. An extremely important part of the ecology of this area is buffalo dung. It is very fertilizing. And on a clearing like this, which of course you can see now has a green sheen to it as a result of those little, that little bit of rain we had, that buffalo dung will make it play a hugely important role 
in maintaining the health of this clearing. Uh, we're going to turn around. No, we're not going to carry on here. Ooh. Brian? Look. Now, Vicky, you give Brian a 9.5 for his turkey gobble. Well, I'm not sure where the other half a mark would come from, but uh, thank you for that. And Lucy in South Bend, you say he sounds exactly like a turkey. He mercifully does not look like a turkey. Brian, I really enjoy these swallows, and I think they're sitting like this just before they mass. They're about to leave. They're about to head back to Gerda in Belgium, not Belgium, in the Netherlands, um, and of the Luberon Valley in the south of France. Soon they will be heading that way. 32 days, 8,500 kilometers. That's quite a distance for a little bird like that to cover. Isn't that amazing? That's the barn swallow, everyone. Anna Marie, you saw some robins today, a male and a female, and you say that's your first sign of spring. Well, that's good. I, I would have thought it's quite early. But yes, the robins have clearly sensed change. Brian also does a number of other interesting um, vocal impressions, the most impressive of which I think is um, the impression of Popeye the Sailor Man. <laughs> Brian, would you like to do Popeye the Sailor Man? That barn swallow doesn't seem to mind. <laughs> so, as I was saying yesterday, yesterday, the barn swallow, of course, 32 days migration, eight and a half thousand kilometers, which is miles, as you multiply, divide that by 1.6, and you'll get the number of miles. So, roughly, probably about six thousand, five and a half thousand miles, and. I've just got to get that out of my head now. I, we've had a pretty rough season, okay? Not much water. We definitely have far fewer insects than normal, which means that the fat layer or the fat deposit that those swallows are able to have laid on for their big migration, I think is going to be less. And therefore, I think fewer of the swallows are going to make the long trip. So that's a little bit sad. It's completely normal, completely within the realms of our sort of functioning biosphere of the Earth. But I do think that fewer, fewer of them are going to make it back to breed this year. And, and they don't sit like that normally. Normally in the middle of summer, they'll be flying around, they'll be in a group that won't... That kind of sitting behavior where they sit and stare longingly to the north is an indicator that they're about to leave. It's so interesting to watch. Something, something kicks over in their physiology and they just know it's, it's time to move. Now, there's a clearing up ahead here where there are some mongoose quite often. One nice thing about Wendy, of course, apart from her fairly recalcitrant manner, is that she has some much softer suspension than the other two. a lot more comfortable driving her. Lots of elephant activity around last night. Much done, much uh, in the way of footprints, tracks. Brian, there must be a dwarf mongoose here somewhere, surely. Or a leopard, I'll take a leopard. There is a kudu. seems to be grazing, which is an odd thing for a browser to do. He's a magnificent bull, that. I 
think I heard a mongoose. No, it's not. It's a bird. Interesting. Maggie, you've asked an interesting question about when we had that little discussion about carnivores and herbivores and who lives longer. And the implication there, of course, was that it was the diet. Um, Maggie and you saying, is it not more the size? I think it's probably a bit of both, but I, you know, um, a leopard, for example, which can live in theory to about 16 years. Um, well, I mean, I suppose it's the same length of time that a buffalo would live. I think in captivity, a buffalo might live a little bit longer. I think also, quite apart from the diet, which of course they've all adapted to eat, I think what you'll find is that the toll of life, uh, being a carnivore, is a lot harder. Hunting and defending territory the way that a carnivore does because I think it's, you know, I mean, the reason there's so, there's so many fewer carnivores than there are herbivores, of course, is that uh, it's a lot more difficult to live like that. Now, if you live as a lion and you're defending territory consistently and you are basically, I mean, to, to hunt something, if you're a lioness, to take down a zebra is a major physical strain. And I think that the, you'll find that even though they live the same, potentially have the same um, lifespan is something like a buffalo, they will generally live less time because the strain taken by the body is that much more. So I think in captivity, where a leopard can live for up to 20 years in captivity, uh, and what, I mean, how, what the equivalent size herbivore would be a, would be an impala, I suppose. An impala, I think, yeah, would probably potentially live that long in captivity as well. So without the sort of strains that they take, I don't think it's a diet-related issue. I'm not sure it's a size-related issue either. I think it is largely to do with the stresses and strains of being a carnivore rather than a herbivore. Very nice query, that. It's a very nice thing to think about. I'm not sure that I've quite nailed down the answer yet. We're getting a bit late for the mongoose now. I think many of them are going to be out of their dens already. But were we to see a leopard, I would happily sacrifice the mongoose GoPro activities. Cindy, you say, is it possible that the dry season here may lead us into a wetter dry season? So we've had a drought. May we, might we have a wetter winter than we would normally? See, Cindy, it's, it's possible, um, but uh, it wouldn't be one as a result of the other. So, I mean, because we've had a, dry, a drought, a very dry, wet, rainy season, um, it wouldn't follow necessarily that we would have a wetter, wet, the dry season. So, um, it's possible that it could happen, but one wouldn't follow the other. Oh, hello, beefy. Look at that big buffalo. Yes, you're very, very cross. I'm running off and trotting off into the bush. I've often thought to myself that I'd like to introduce a matador to one of these things. Those people who still think it's acceptable to be stabbing bulls. To introduce them to an African buffalo and see how they like that. That one, of course, is having his nose picked by an ox picker, which is a lovely thing to do in the morning. It's like a sort of spa treatment, I suppose. Clean out the nose, get the ticks out of the nose. <laughs> that ox picker nearly landed on Brian's head. Um, 
right, it decided better of it and has settled on the buffalo. Now, while we are sitting here listening for mongoose alarm calling, I'm going to send you across to Scott, who is sitting at the moisture and verdant lands of Buffel's Hook Dam. Well, welcome to the Buffel's Hook Waterhole. As you can see, the Woodlands Kingfishers are keeping us entertained here. They, I think, are having their morning bath. There's a very, very vague chance there goes another one. Well done, Jandre. Oops. Um, so, great work there, Jandre, on camera. Not an easy thing following these Woodlands Kingfishers as they have their morning bath. There's three of them perched up in those bushes. You can just probably see three little, a little bit more to the right, you'll get the third one in Azor genre. There we go. And they're all having their morning bath time. These are kingfishers that actually don't rely on fishing for food. They catch insects for their prey. Not frogs or fish, as their name suggests, so that can be a little bit misleading. The woodlands kingfishers are coming from literally all angles. There must be at least seven or eight that are doing their rounds here. And here's one that's landed right up in the tree next to us. That's awesome. Now, what we could expect to see is some of their displaying, where they, as they land on the branch after their flight, they'll hold their wings up high into the air, displaying their beautiful, bright turquoise backs. So that's something that I'm hoping we're going to see. The birds are going ballistic here. And what I'm going to suggest is we just keep quiet for 30 seconds or so and listen to the morning bird song. Jean, at the top of this tree over here, there's a rare individual called an African pied wagtail. This is a bird that we may not have shown you many times before. Like I said, it's the African pied wagtail. If and when it walks along the water's edge, it will be wagging its tail wildly, hence its name. Oh, Jean-Dre, um, at about one o'clock, um, there was some action unfolding. There it goes, a predatory bird from right flying to... There we go, great work. I'm not too sure what it is, but it's a little raptor. Possibly a gabar goshawk or something along those lines, or maybe a lizard buzzard. Awesome, awesome stuff. What a beautiful day it is, and you can certainly tell by the birds that they are enjoying the sunshine. Good news. We have got a slow motion clip that the girls in FC have prepared for you of the Woodlands Kingfisher plummeting into the water. So take a closer look and enjoy. So I hope you enjoyed that. I'm not sure if it was necessarily this individual that you saw, as there are many woodlands kingfishers that have come here for a bath. There's another little kingfisher that I'm keeping my eye out for called a malachite kingfisher. They are tiny, so easy to overlook, but have got awesome, awesome coloration on them. Oranges, dark blues, considerably different to the woodlands kingfishers that we've been taking a look at now. Wunderbar. Well, it seems like the chaos has calmed down, so let's continue on. I want to keep checking our northern boundary and keep slowly making our way towards the hyena den. Oh, 
as we go through this little dip, we may lose picture temporarily, but don't go anywhere. It'll pop back up shortly afterwards, so hold tight as we go through this little dip. to know if we see any ostrich here in the Sabi Sands and not uh, very often, no, but it is possible to see ostrich here in the Manyaleti Reserve, which is just north of us, not far at all. They've got a lot more open grasslands and plains and their ostrich sightings are common, but even very close by now, I'm talking, that's 10 miles away, you'll start seeing ostriches uh, very commonly. Whereas where we are here, it's just the wrong habitat. It's a bit too thick for them. So that's why we very seldomly see them. I think James has seen one giraffe and myself, uh, ostrich rather, uh, and Brent. We've all seen, I think, the same ostrich that moved through the Sabi Sands when we were all working to the south of where we are now. So we've all agreed and worked out that it was all in a very similar time frame. It was a female ostrich. So we're guessing the one and only time we have all seen one was probably the same individual making her way through the area. They are fascinating birds, ostriches, Mr. R. Beard in Colorado. Um, Quite scary, actually. I find them quite scary. I don't know what it is about them. Another bird uh, that we don't uh, have occurring here, or that I don't actually even, I've never actually heard of, is a flicker. Oh, Sandy in Oregon, you were wondering whether we get them here, or a little diker. We can see you. You can run, but you cannot hide. Look at its little tail waggling. <laughs> well, you have you have a good day. Seems like nothing's gonna get in your way this morning, Mr. Diker. And enjoy nibbling on those fresh green shoots. That's a fully grown adult male, and it's probably only about knee high. So Sandy, obviously a flicker is a bird that's similar to a woodpecker because you've acknowledged that we do get the woodpeckers here. Um, but no, I've never heard of a flicker and we do not get them here. But what we do get is hornbills, one of my favorites. And this one is perching itself perfectly in the bright morning sunshine. Huh? I think we're looking at different ones, John. Right? There's another one higher right up there. Yeah. Sorry. There we go. Look at that bright pink pouch below its beak there. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I love chatting a little bit of hornbill. <laughs> what are we saying to one another? I don't know. But it's fun. Such characters, the hornbills. And these are some really wonderful views. Perfect morning sunshine. Bright blue sky in the background. It's sitting in a silver cluster leaf tree. And you'll pick up that kind of silvery tinge. 
Ich mache schon den Lauf, wo ich... Now, if it gets really worked up, it's going to start holding its wings up. I think it may go for it. Oh, no. Come on. Put your wings up. They're kind of just building up to a crescendo here, slowly. It just appears that there's one feather out of place that needs to be repositioned before the main show. Ah! Oh, it's a happy couple getting ready for the day. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Come on, give us the full show. They're thinking about it. They'll hold their wings high up above their head once they get into full swing. One more try. You've got one more chance, guys. Come on. Perfect. You took your last opportunity, and we thank you for that. How awesome was that? Hey, that was just too good to be true. Maybe one more time. Here goes. That was awesome. Let's maybe just see. I think they might do one more. They seem to be in full swing now. Here they go. <laughs> Thank you, little birds. We're going to leave you to it and continue making our way towards the hyena den. Perfect timing. Off you go. And we will be sending you guys off to Samanyala with James. That is me making the sound of a mongoose. Well, a poor sound of a mongoose attempting to coax them out of what used to be or possibly still is a burrow for them in this particular part of quarantine clearings. Those obviously are not mongoose. Mongoose are not antelope with horns on them. They are small carnivores. Those are two nyala, two youngish male nyala, just about in their, the prime of their lives. One on the left, younger than the one on the right. And they are just walking through this clearing trying to find something delicious to eat. Now they are browsing antelope. And so what they're looking for largely will be forbs. Now, a forb is the kind of um, nondescript term for any kind of herbaceous plant that isn't a grass. So it would be kind of an unidentified flower or an unidentified herb growing on the ground. So although they look like they're grazing sometimes, they're normally going for what we'd call a forb. But most importantly, there are no mongoose here. You can hear the subtle dawn chorus. Ubiquitous woodland kingfisher. Lots going on in the background. A greater blue ear glossy starling. A an oriole. Scott reckons that the mongoose should only be getting up now. But they're still sleeping. Brian kind of tends to agree, don't you, Brian? Mm. And certainly, I mean, with that one time that Brian went and I went on a walk, and we got to within two and a half meters of them, that was much later on in the morning, wasn't it? No. So maybe they're just very lazy. You say when 
I make that mongoose attracting sound, it sounds like I'm kissing myself in the mirror. I have nothing to say to that, Jinbi. But thank you for warning me of it. What I shall do is make sure that Brian puts the camera on me so that you will know that I am not kissing myself on the wrist, for example, like a practicing teenage girl. Jinbi, I'm not going to be too shy to ever say it again. Here are the guinea fowl again. Let's just stop here. Brenda, you're in Virginia, and you say that the guinea fowl, there are domesticated guinea fowl in the U.S. That's very interesting. I, I knew that, I think they're bred for food there, aren't they? That guinea fowl has got fresh elephant poop all over its face. I'm really pleased that I don't have to do that to get a meal in the morning. Elephant dung, if it's ripened to the right age, say about two weeks, is a really pleasant smelling, but uh, at its current form, um, no, no, not nice. It's a really nice shot of a guinea fowl. Caught in the early morning light. I'm still searching the clearing here for sign of dwarf mongoose. Gorgeous morning. A couple of virtual starlings calling off to the side. They're very cross, Franklin. No leopards at this stage. All right, let's drive along. Hello, Bob in Canada. Bob, that Google Maps, you want to know if you can get hold of a map here so that you can follow along on the game drive. Um, Bob, the best thing to do is just to go to Google Maps. The roads of, Quar of um, Juma are largely labelled there. So you can just put in Juma Private Game Reserve on Google Maps, zoom in there, and you can see exactly where we are and what we're doing. I'm not sure the roads on Arethusa are. In fact, I don't think they are, but they certainly are for Juma and for Cheetah Plains. Brian, where are the mongoose? You said that guinea fowl are sometimes used as a watch fowl in the U.S. A watch fowl, of course, being something that you might use a goose for, uh, like a watchdog. I didn't know that. That's interesting. I suppose they are very good at alarm calling. A watch fowl. Siberia, as you may you say, your father used to keep some guinea fowl, two guinea fowl, and what they used to do is keep the tick population down. That's interesting. I wonder who decided, I mean, there must be similar kind of evolutionary equivalents in the U.S. Um, I suppose a turkey, really. Isn't a turkey a naturally occurring bird in the continental U.S.? Brian, that was your cue. There we go. Apparently they are used like a goose. Thank you for that, everybody. Now, Kimba, like Simba, but with a K, Kimba, 
You want to know what those, elef what those elephants, what those elephants are looking for in the guinea fowl dung, what the guinea fowl are looking for in the elephant dung, and they are looking for invertebrates. So any kind of termite or a fly or a fly larvae or the larvae of a beetle or even a beetle itself that may have landed on the dung that will then be eaten by the guinea fowl. They're not eating, I suppose they might also eat some fresh seeds if they found some seeds there, but it would be largely the insects. I'm just hearing something up ahead there. It's an alarm calling squirrel. Sitting right here. Now a squirrel normally a great liar. Just looking behind us. And they don't shout at human beings normally. That's quite sweet though, isn't it? What are you shouting at, rodent? <laughs> Where are the mongoose? Ah, not not here. Mm -mm. Mm. I see. Traumatic. Yes, I know. Must have been difficult for you. Hmm. You are going on a bit now. Okay, let's head back across to Scott. He's got some hornbills. I'm going to give the squirrel a talking to and then find some mongoose. Shut up. Well, we are also searching desperately for any sign of these dwarf mongooses and a good place to check is on top of termite mounds and we found some more yellow-billed hornbills these ones are feeding on the termites and it's a perfect combo deal because there's not only delicious breakfast on this ginormous termite mound but there's also a nice warm column of air coming up out of that little chimney where the Hornbills feeding, obviously we can't see that, but I can guarantee you there's a, oh, there's the Hornbills mate, come back. I can guarantee you there's a very, very warm air rising up out of that hole. And it's still quite a crisp morning, so the Hornbills gonna be enjoying a warm spot to have a plentiful breakfast. James Richards, I couldn't agree with you more. The sighting we shared earlier with the Hornbills was one of the best that I've managed to have with you guys. So very happy that that worked out. And wasn't it wonderful that we got to see them kind of from start to finish building up that crescendo or to that crescendo. And it is marvelous that the way they synchronized their little dance move. We're gonna leave them be because a few moments before you joined us, I did share some hyena audio nearby, and we are quite close to the hyena den. So, let's keep going. that Marilyn in Montana has got the pied wagtail to add to a bird list now, so that's some good news. And Lucy in South Bend, Indiana, you are 
hoping that I'll be able to find you at least one more bird before I head off to add to your very comprehensive list of 182 birds. And I will certainly be trying my best to do that. Who knows, maybe we will get the ostrich giving us a special visit. That would be a wonderful bird to show you guys. They are bizarre, like I was saying earlier. There's something about them that actually scares me. Those long legs and long neck, big beady eye, strange beasts, the old ostrich. Okay, so we are on Aubrey's Road now, and the hyena den is not too far away. in Leesburg. You would like to know if I've got any thoughts as to why it is that hyena have evolved into a matriarchal society, a female dominated society, whereas most other mammals will uh, be the complete opposite. It will be the men that are the biggest and the most dominant. I can't for the life of me uh, work that, that one out, Ben. Uh, there may be many different theories that people have on that topic, but I don't think anyone will be able to answer those questions. Um, what would have caused those evolutionary changes to be so different to the rest of the mammalian race is, is hard to understand, you know? Maybe a small ecological niche caused that at the time, but I, I certainly don't have any solid reasons as to why that is the case. I guess you could ask yourself the same question with zebra. I mean, why is it that zebra have become black and white? I mean, what purpose does it serve? There's no other animals in Africa that have gone that route. Yet they have. Okay. One hyena from where we are here. Morning. How are you? And there is a, another one, I think, possibly moving around further off on the other side of the mound. I can just see a brief glimpse of its ear. Uh, there you go. There it goes. So we may not be on the best side of the mound to see the action. But at least there are a few individuals here. There's a herd of impala on the other side of this mound. That's what the hyena's got its ears pricked up for, and its head is looking in that direction. And the impala even letting off the odd, very soft alarm call. Obviously a little bit perturbed by the hyena here. This is a youngster, I'm not too sure which one it is, but it is a young individual you can see. It's in very good condition, that's one sign. It's very fluffy and furry and it's got very dark spots. So those features all lead up to it being young. Let's see if we can't move around onto the other side of the mound. If we don't have too much luck here, and if it's not looking active, then we will, or highly active, then we will continue on the search for the dwarf mongooses. Hello, Lady Luga. You would like to know exactly how... Oh, let's just get a glimpse of this, Chandra. What happened to your foot? Eh? And who are you? Is it just a thorn in there? It could just be that it's got a thorn in its pad. You can see now it's...
tried to walk on it. But not having much luck. There's also a zebra just off across here. It's a lot of general game grazing about the hyena den. Let's see if we can't reposition around a little bit. Um, Lady Luca, you'd like to know a little bit more about Aubrey's Road and how Aubrey the Geiger would have had an impact in building the road or possibly designing or choosing where it, it, it runs. That's probably the case. I'm actually not sure whether it was just named after him or whether he actually helped design it. I'm not too sure. I think it could be that it was simply named after him. What is going on? Why has the one hyena gone running off now? This other one also showing interest. Have they heard something that's worth running off to? Just the other day, they ran off from the den and all got involved in a tussle with some wild dog. Some of you would have been lucky enough to be there with James when that happened. But something's going on. It's literally moving on exactly the same trail that that other hyena was moving along. And it's fascinating how strong their sense of smell is. I mean, there's going to be a lot of hyena scent going up and down, backwards and forwards through this area. But he or she can work out exactly which one is freshest. Yeah, this one's taking a wide berth of those zebra. Zebra can be quite fierce, considering they are herbivores, and they will chase a lot of the smaller predators, like hyena, jackal, sometimes even leopard. So that hyena made the right move, and that's it. That's the hyena den site, inactive in a few moments. So I'm glad we arrived when we did. Siberia, Zumi, you've mentioned that meerkats also live in a matriarchal society where the females run the show. I didn't know that. Um, uh, Brian would be a good guy to actually chat about with meerkats. He spent a long time filming them for Wild Earth many years ago. I'm not actually sure exactly what they did there, but they were doing some filming of meerkats. And that will be interesting if that is the case. So thank you, Siberia Zumi, for shedding light on that. <clears throat> Come on, mongooses. been a lot of cute animals around this summer, but one of my favorite are the kudu. And James has found some, so you're in luck. Look at the beautiful color there of the backlit golden foliage of the Cambritum woodland framing two little kudu. Now, the interesting thing there is that they are babies. They look to be almost exactly the same size. And we did see one female, one cow, running through here. And I wonder if they aren't perhaps twins. It does happen from time to time out here. It is very unusual, especially with the precocial animals like um, the antelope, which are born sort of fully formed and ready to run. It is very unusual. 
but it is possible. And I only saw one female here. I can still just see her wandering through the woods. You won't be able to see her at this stage. But isn't that interesting? And they will stand dead still because they don't really know if we can see them or not. And they're listening desperately with those ears. I do sometimes wish I had ears like that. It would help me to find animals and, you know, listen to music more accurately. I suppose I would look a bit odd. Oh, no. Can't believe this. Scott has found a mongoose dead sight. Ah. That was my link, Nicky. You can go across to him now. <laughs> Brian, we have... Okay. We've found the dwarf mongooses and a large termite mound. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop off and get my little camera into a good spot. So I'm not sure where to put it, but we'll work it out. Um, I'm just going to take a little kind of reusable cable here, cable tie kind of thing, in case I need to strap the... Um, camera down onto something and what I'm going to also do is I'm going to leave my cell phone up here that will give you a preview of the picture so Jeanre can help me confirm that I've put it in the right spot here goes sorry mongooses we're just going to temporarily interfere with your morning this is them alarm calling and I think what we should do don't worry I come in peace I come in peace. Chippa, chippa, chippa. <laughs> and I'm just going to put the little camera probably right down here. Just like that. That should get some decent views. How's that looking on the camera, Jandre? Oh, not too bad. Decent. Hey, hard with the glare. Yeah, I know, no, that's cool. Maybe tilt it up a bit. Cool. There's a bit of a delay. Tilt it up. Yeah. Cool. OK. So, we're in luck. Now we have to sit and patiently wait. I'm sure it won't take them too long to poke their head back out of that little hole. Yay. There it is. It's already poked its head out. And we just want to try and get to understand these animals a little bit better and what we can do with them regarding filming. I think it's going to maybe go right up to this little camera to investigate it, just to make sure it's not a threat. Morning. Don't worry, it's a friendly visitor. You can go up to it, though, if you want. You may become famous. You may become the most well-known dwarf mongoose on the whole planet. This is your opportunity. <laughs> it's certainly not too sure what to think of it, but it's giving it a, a once-over. And what you may find is it may call for some reinforcements to come and investigate that little strange device further. I was really surprised uh, at the fact of when I was making my way out there. Oh, there's another one that just popped up over there. When I was making my way out there, it really was very kind of relaxed with my presence. It was still keeping an eye on me when I was about a meter and a half away from that little entrance hole. So you live a leisurely life. You only get up about an hour after sunrise, hey? Not bad. Sure, yeah. Oh, look at that. That one's standing on its back legs, which is a pose typical of meerkats. Oh, check Jean by the camera. We've got another one investigating. It, 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 it kind of popped in 
from the right of the screen. It's further to the right now. Here it comes. <laughs> Morning. Go and have a closer look. Hello, Mac Weezer. You'd like to know if the plural of mongoose is mongeese. And some will say yes and others will say no. Uh, I, I certainly say mongeese, but I think technically you are supposed to say mongooses. But... Like I said, there'll be varying opinions on that. Now, I wonder how many termites are termites, how many dwarf mongooses are living in this mound. There's technically supposed to be an alpha pair, a dominant pair of male and female that rule the roost here, and the rest all help out. Which one's which, obviously, is very difficult to tell, and how big this actual troop is was also very tricky to tell. I'm very happy that we found them, and now we can watch them as they take a very, very leisurely start to the morning. A few of them, like this one, being sentries, making sure there's no threats. I'm sure they're going to head off and start foraging in and around this area soon. Hello to Boyd in North Carolina. You would like to know exactly what will they be foraging for when they do head off? Mainly small insects, but any very small mammals, reptiles, snakes, anything really that they can overpower, even little baby birds they would feed on. But it's mainly small insects that I've seen in my time. Then again, it would be, oh, there's another one poking its hole out looking at the camera. That's just what we want. Perfect you can come closer to investigate. Now, that little camera um, is not going to be providing you a very close-up view, even though from that distance, the, the, the mongoose is probably about a foot away. It's going to be quite far. It's a very wide angle on that little camera. Sadly, there's no preview available while I'm filming. So we, I've been filming for five minutes now, and I just want to keep, keep the film running rather than stopping it and missing anything that may happen quickly. So I'm not too sure exactly how good the, the, the visuals are of the little mongooses, but their response to us is great. They've come out within a minute of us disturbing them as they went back into their, into their hiding places. And that's something that can happen very commonly for them, so I don't think it's a huge disturbance to their day, no different to if a bird of prey flew over. Let's take a look on the left here, Jandre. That sentry is not doing too much, but there's a few ferreting about in the grass here. Let's try and work out what they're up to. There was about two or three there. Maybe they are little youngsters, and sure, they disappear very quickly into that long grass. Now, the awesome thing about this time of the year is that there are Lots of young dwarf mongooses around. And Michelle, you've just asked about a dwarf mongoose den that's near the Juma Pan and whether there are some youngsters there. Yes, there's kind of medium-sized youngsters all over at the moment. Um, all of the mongooses are kind of breeding at the same time. So you've, you find all of them, the, the youngsters, about half the size of the adults at the moment. And there are den sites all over Juma. Um, and not only will a dwarf, well, dwarf mongooses won't only have one uh, kind of den site, they'll have multiple den sites that they can sleep in every night. So they might spend one in one, another night in another. They'll move more frequently between their various dens. 
uh, than animals like hyena, for example. So even though they may have one den there, it's not necessarily going to be the one that they use all the time. Oh, we've got another visitor coming in. I think at some point one's going to go very close up to that little camera. Maybe this is the brave individual. <laughs> Thinking about it, but not entirely happy with whatever this strange new beast is. I'm told that in this part of the world, Michelle, they've got about a one hectare uh, range. Oh, this is going to be good. Come on. There we go. There we go. Morning. Oh. <laughs> oh, look, the Duke. I love the way you're thinking you want the mongoose to grab onto the camera and take it down into its burrows for internal tour, and wouldn't that be absolutely fascinating if we could get a spy, a mongoose spy that could take us in and show us what exactly goes on within this termite mound. We would need to give it a little head torch, though, to illuminate uh, the, the tunnels, but it certainly is a wonderful way of thinking. Maybe one of those endoscopes with like a long cord could be fed in and you could get a better idea of what is happening in all the various chambers. Oh, uh, well, there's good news. And that is that James has found a, another troop of mongooses and he's busy setting up or getting ready to set up his little camera there. So we will send you across to make sure you don't miss out on any of that action. Have fun. Hello, everybody. We found a mongoose nest. Well, I mean, I'd love to say we found it. Actually, we drove past a game drive that was viewing this mongoose burrow. But there's a mongoose in there. We had to chase him back in there because we thought he was going to abscond. Now, you're just here in time for me to direct him. I've cleaned the lens. I'm going to push go. You checked your settings? Well, I only have one setting, on and off. Good job. Yes. Now, we're going to sit here, and we're actually going to call him out. Brian, make the noise. Might be filming a great deal of not a lot. Oh well, it might be quite interesting to see. I'm not sure how long that battery will last. And we only saw one there, but I can hear others calling. Of course, what you'll probably find is that there are three or four entrances to this den, and they will go out, all of them, except the one with the camera in front of it. <laughs> all right, Scott is with the active mongoose nest let's go across there obviously he is okay Jandre, there's some coming down to the camera sorry there's ha action happening everywhere here they're coming up from that l kind of grassy little pathway that should do it so i think it's just hidden in a little ravine but there was a group of two or three and I think they're kind of three teenagers that are a bit of a get-along gang that looked like at one stage they were heading back towards the camera, but I think now they've scurried off. 
Jean has found another one. That one's quite high up on the top. Oh, there's one's popped out in front of the camera again, but it just poked its head back in the hole. <laughs> Well done, jean -Dre. And isn't this fun doing something a little bit different, getting to know what's happening with this colony? There's some individuals, I'm sorry to chop throw you all over the show, jean -Dre, but these, these, the, the musketeers are busy making their way further and further afield. They are obviously hungry. Oh, and here, jean -Dre, if you zoom out of it, there's one kind of out in the open, just in front of the bull bar. I don't know if you're angled. There it goes. Our first individual has crossed the road. So it looks like now they are feeling comfortable and safe and are deciding that it's time to head off. I think there's another one that's about to follow suit there, jean -Dre. If you just wait somewhere around here. There we go. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> so two, two have made their way out from the den. Looks like a third is, is going to follow now along that same pathway. There you can just see a glimpse of it. Well done, jean -Dre. And this is number three. I think these are the three musketeers. There's three of them that have been kind of playing about together. <laughs> Too close. The car got in the way. But again, a good sign that they are comfortable with us. Okay, now that's awesome. We've managed to establish that three members of this troop have moved east in search of breakfast. Now what's going to be fascinating to work out is maybe how many more are going to slowly come out of here. Are there some that are still sleeping, taking it easy, um, tending to young? Who knows? But those three, I've got a feeling, and I could be completely wrong, but like I said, I think those are the teenagers that are like, we big enough to do what we like. We'll stay in earshot of the den in case mom or dad shouts at us and we need to come back but I'm confident that there are still quite a few more members within this termitarium. Time will tell. Shame James isn't having much luck his side. Um, I hope that changes. But if they have, I, I'm, fairly, I'm fairly certain it will. They're gonna have to come out of the termite mound at some stage, it's just whether or not it's in a reasonable hour. Okay, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something here now because there's quite a few mongooses running out and I'm just gonna jump out quickly. There's another one that's about to cross the road and I wanna reposition the GoPro in a spot where I'm hoping we can get them coming out of their new spot. So, hold on a second. Just gonna try and find their hole they're all emerging from. I think it's around here somewhere. Oh, here it is. Okay. So I've repositioned it into the next burrow and we're gonna just move the vehicle ever so slightly forward so we can keep you guys in the loop as to what's what. So I've unplugged all of my comms to the outside world. Hold on a second. I'm guessing what's going to happen, why I, I did this little stunt now quickly, is because I'm confident that they're going to keep following the, the rest of the mongoose. There's mongooses that are already head, headed out. Um, so we're just going to get onto that next pathway. There is a hole directly in front of where the camera's nestled in the grass then. I'm sure one will pop out of there soon, I'm hoping. Oh no, I picked the wrong hole. Jean-Dre, further to the right of the camera, not too far, I think just there. Yeah, that, there, there was one poking its head out of a hole over there. So it's a lottery, you need a million of these little cameras to plonk in front of every single hole that they can exit out of, I guess. 
If Jana just stays there, though, I'm sure the head will poke out shortly. Okay, um, well, it may take a little bit of time before they pluck up courage to poke their heads out any further. And while we wait for them to do that, we're going to send you back to James for an update on how he's getting along over there. I gave up, everybody. I decided that that den was A, not very picturesque, and B, that mongoose may have been alone with perhaps one other friend and I decided to gamble on the chances of getting a slightly better den. Mm, it may have been a gamble not worth taking. Interesting question from James Richard. You want to know or you wonder where the name mongoose originates? I don't know what the etymology of the word mongoose is, I'm afraid. I think it's, it's quite interesting. I'm going to guess that it's got a, um, a what's the word, a Sanskrit, uh, a Sanskrit base, maybe. I don't know why I think that, a Sanskrit or kind of Hindi, uh, Indian base, maybe. But I, James, I couldn't actually tell you vaguely even. Um, we're going to go towards Treehouse Dam. There were some reports of elephants there, or sort of heading towards there. We're not too far from that area. Obviously, if we see a dwarf mongoose nest, all other plans will fly out the window. Oh. <laughs> there they are. It was a bit of an evil laugh, I feel. Now, Fellows, what I'm going to do is get out of the car and come and place a camera close to you. Now, please don't go too far. You may go back inside, but then you will have to return. No, 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 that's it. Hello, hello, hello. I can hear a number of others calling over there. This is astonishing. Normally they will <laughs> at least make an attempt to come out and say hello. Brian, maybe you give it a try. Catherine, you say you watch because the entertainment of watching grown men making kissing sounds at a mongoose is just too wonderful. Um, well, Catherine, we do like to cater to all tastes, so I'm glad that is amusing to you. I'm just going to reverse slightly, and then we're probably going to just leave this camera here. Lynn, you want to... Ooh, that looks like a puncture right there. Um, Lynn, you say that <laughs> you wish you could see our faces when we were making that noise. Then there's a very good reason that you don't see our faces, and that's because it would just be embarrassing. Uh, slightly flat tire there. I'm not sure it's going to survive the drive.
Now, Gilly, you reckon that that, uh, that GoPro might look like a long-legged predatory bird, and maybe that's why the mongoose don't come. I don't think they're that gormless. I think they know that that's inanimate. Well, maybe it's frightening them. We were speaking about thrushes earlier, and I can hear a ground scraper thrush. There, that tick, tick, brrr. Right, I tell you what, let's just go down. Let's go down to Treehouse Dam, have a look at what's going on there. Maybe change the tire, and we'll come back. Because I think if we sit here all day waiting for my mongoose to do something useful, please come out. Safari Dean, nice question. Will mongoose scavenge on dead animals? Um, Safari Dean, no, not really. It's actually, it's not, it's not a um, ground scrape thrush. It's just a stickiller. Um, Safari Dean, I know they won't. They'll norm. I mean, diet of insects largely, small reptiles and eggs. I don't think that they would scavenge on. I mean, they might eat a, uh, they might eat a dead beetle if they found it. So I mean, that might be described as scavenging, I suppose. There are some giraffe, right? Deep in the bushes. Obviously, and very thick bush there. I'm afraid. That's uh, not a wonderful picture. Anyway. They are in there. <laughs> Nicholas says you can see its bum. Yes. And flicking fly swatter tail, very important part of a giraffe's anatomy. <laughs> I, I, I feel like we've had better giraffe sightings, Brian. Mm, me too. Yeah. Mm, there's another one. Beautiful. Really stunning stuff there. We should probably submit these shots for an award. Mm. It looks like a bull. And he's walking around with another three or four. There are another three or four in there. The largest group I've seen here was about 20. That's quite a lot. That isn't that group. All right, let's go to the water, see if the elephants are there, and then we'll come back and see if we can retrieve my GoPro, which will no doubt by then have the mongoose equivalent of Casablanca on its hard drive. Safari Dean, we're still going on about, uh, we're still chatting about scavenging mongoose. Will they scavenge on big animals? No, they won't. They won't scavenge on big animals. I think that they would be out of their comfort zone trying to do that. I certainly haven't heard of them doing it, so no, I don't think they would. I mean, just about all the big animals here would be scavenged off by much larger scavengers. And I think if you're going to be a scavenger, you have to have a certain um, kind of physiology that can cope with the bacteria and that sort of thing of rotting meat. Now, while I've no doubt that a mongoose's constitution is probably stronger than ours, I wouldn't say it's anything like a hyena or a, um, or a lion's or a leopard's. See, um, you've missed why we're doing this GoPro uh, mongoose thing. What we're trying to do, AC, is just see if we can't get some kind of interaction. Are there more in there? Yep. <laughs> oh, there they are. Let me go a little bit further forward. Oh, and there's some babies. What a pity we don't have my camera with me. Oh, look, the light is perfect. Ah, gosh, this is just 
This is horrendous. So, AC, um, we just want to see if we can't get some kind of a reaction from them if they come up and if they stick their faces in the lens. There was a lovely video shot the other day at a place called Mala Mala where one or two mongoose came up and just kind of interacted with the camera. It was quite amusing. Just a GoPro camera like that that was left there at the base. And it was quite funny. So we just wanted to see if we could get something similar. I'm sorely tempted to go and retrieve my GoPro, but I'm not going to because I know these guys will move. They're very sweet, though. Suddenly, they're all over the place. So Brian was absolutely correct. I thought maybe we'd missed them coming out of the dens, and he said, no, no, he didn't think they'd got up yet, and he was right. They've only got up as it started to get quite hot. A tiny little baby you're looking at there. Uh, <laughs> Um, you say, Elaine, this makes you think of the a game that is played in Michigan called Whack-A-Mole, where you, a number of children will spread out um, amongst the holes where the moles come out, and your job is to whack the mole on the head as it sticks its head out. Elaine, um, I don't think we'll be going along the same route as that today, especially given the fact that I'm trying desperately to make them come out and confide with my GoPro camera and not run away in abject terror at the thought of being bopped upon the head as they stick their heads out. There are lots of babies here. This might be a good one. It's a pity I don't have another GoPro. Hang on a second. Gen B, you've heard that mongoose have got the fastest reflexes of any animal, and you want to know if that is true. Um, no, I would say it is not true. I would say a lot of the bird species have got faster reflexes than these. I think within the mammals, they've probably got a pretty good idea, a pretty good sense of reflex, but I don't think that you'll find that they are as fast as many of the birds. Now, I'm going to cheat here, everyone. I have another camera, but it's not a GoPro. But I'm going to put it here anyway, on a little tripod given to me very kindly by Wilm Durenbrach. It was a tripod made, um, well, in the cheapest fashion possible. This might be quite good, actually. <laughs> OK, they are going to move as I get out of the car. I'm just going to lean over, kind of, and pop the thing onto the ground here. And I'll use a bit of zoom. I obviously can't open the door now. Just keep digging, little fellow. Has he caught something there, Brian? Don't move. Mm. Agile is a, well, a not very agile thing. Okay. Try and put your camera a bit closer. But do you not think that they're going to panic like the others yeah, do? Yeah, come out again. All right. I'll try and get a decent focal range. There we go. All right, let's. Let's see what happens there, everyone. I suspect with that camera that everything is going to be out of focus because you kind of got to tell it what to focus on. <laughs> uh, I 
suspect like many things in life, you can probably get quite good at doing this, but the, the first time round, well, if, unless you're talented like Scott, of course, in which case it will be easy, but for most of us, take a bit of time to learn to do it. <laughs> No elephants here, but there have been elephants here. I can see tracks of them going across the road here. No, there's nothing here now. You've come at a good time because we've just seen a bird, John. That's just above. There we go. Black-headed Oriole. And wasn't that a perfect twist of fate? We lost signal on James's vehicle. Oh, listen. They're calling. What a beautiful call. Oh, little poop. <laughs> and off it goes. You sang for us, you pooped for us, and then you flew away for us. After initially perching itself on the perfect little branch, we don't get to see those birds very often. So that was a bonus. Ah! And even though you joined us temporarily, you're going straight back to James. There too. The two t <laughs> this is amazing, people. Um, I know you heard me talking there as we came across, but it's because there are some fascinating things going on here. That is a leopard tortoise in the water. In fact, I, it's the same leopard tortoise that I found the other day. <laughs> <laughs> The big one is the same leopard tortoise I found the other day, not too far from here, and I lay on the ground next to him. He's a huge fellow. And I know it's the same one because his his shell, you can see, has lost uh, the kind of outer covering there. I suspect he was in a fire at some stage, or he's just really old. And he's, I mean, they're not aquatic at, at all. He's drinking. He's having a swim and having a drink, like you might on a hot day. And he's sharing this pond with some other chelonids. Uh, as you saw there, a terrapin... <laughs> falling uh, off the high board. I think he probably he looked like he purposely walked around to the highest point and then jumped into the water. And there are lots of them in this little puddle, none of them anything like his size. There we go. And I think uh, Nikki says she can make a quick slow-mo of, uh, of that terrapin diving off the high board. Nicola, absolutely, let's have a look at that, probably a four out of ten. So, really, a poorly executed dive there. Uh, we, we know that to do an effective dive, you want to make as small a splash as possible. Uh, that thing landing flat on its back was unable to make anything but a large splash. But I just think it's really funny to... I mean, it's kind of... The morning is heating up quite, quite a lot to find this tortoise walking in here for his swim and then the turtle, not turtle, the terrapin, seemingly walking around to the highest point and then leaping in off the high board, I think is wonderful. I write a whole children's story about it. And Brian, just to the left, that little one looks like the, it's going to come out again. You see it there? Yeah, right there. Are you at full, full stretch? Mm. Mm. Anyway, so two, two species in there. One, obviously, the leopard tortoise, our most obvious and, I think, magnificent chelonid or tortoise-like species. And then the marsh terrapin, lots of them come out of the mud where they've been estivating and they're enjoying the warmth of that muddy water. That is so cool. Luke the Duke and Kimber, you reckon that that, ter that uh, terrapin needed to get a 9 out of 10 for that, I think, rather pathetic effort to die? Well, 
I mean, I'm no, no expert when it comes to Olympic diving, so maybe you're correct. Let's head across to Scott. He's got some buffalo. Well, we've just popped across to Arethusa, and it didn't take us long to stumble upon this breeding herd of buffalo. Settle down, you two. Why are you two ladies having a squabble? The one, look, there's a tiny little calf following it. Maybe that's why. Maybe that mommy was being protective over that little new addition to the herd. Cute. Let's keep going. I feel like this is a very large herd, and I think they're spread out across both sides of the road here. Let's push a little bit deeper into the middle of them and see what happens. A little bit nervous, it appears. Maybe they had a rough night out, being tormented by lions. Although I'd be surprised if that was the case, because I don't think there are any lions across here, but we often do get surprised by the movements and locations of the resident prides here. Oh, no, settle down, guys. You're going to make our lives very difficult if you keep running away. I promise you, we have not seen a lion for days. We don't know where any predators are. You do not need to worry about us. Hmm. They don't seem convinced, do they? They certainly don't seem convinced. Creep forward a bit more. Oh no, yes, I'm popping into a bit of a view. Sure, this is a wonderful guest question that's just come through from Kyle in Florida. It's a hypothetical question, and it goes like this. If all of the herbivores in South Africa were to instantaneously and miraculously turn into carnivores, who do I think would be the apex predators? Well, a herd of Cape buffalo like this would be quite a, quite a tough animal to deal with because of their numbers as well as their strength. There are just so many of them in these large herds, up to thousands, that they would be very formidable. Having said that, though, elephants would also be pretty hardcore. They could just impale things on their tusks, catch things with their trunk. Ugh. Carnivorous elephants. Viams often spoke of a carnivorous herd of elephants, interestingly enough, one of the cameramen. Um, a terrifying beast that would be. So yeah, I, I think uh, Cape buffalo and, and elephant would be two probably of the most formidable because of their size and also because of their social structure. They can live in very large groups. So it would be, yeah, it would be those two for me. What, what, what do you think, Kyle? What are your what are your thoughts as to who would be the the top of the food chain? It's hard to give you an idea of how many buffalo are here, but they are littered on both sides of the road. It's just very thick. And because of their nervous nature this morning, look at how this female is coming to investigate us here. The one on the right really gave us a bit of a look, and now she's already heading off. Let's see if she turns around and gives us an over the shoulder. Sadly, there's a bush in the way. to know what is my favorite spot here on Juma. 
uh, with regards to sitting and waiting and watching animals. Probably Buffalo Waterhole. Uh, there, I'm guessing I've spent more time stationary than any other portion of Juma. And there was a time, just before it dried up, that we were getting some great action there over kind of October, November, December. So, yeah, I think Buffalo Waterhole. There's often always good bird life there, and it just seems to be one of our most productive waterholes. So, probably there. You can see that lady was also giving us an evil stare, as is this one. I promise you guys, there are no lions here. At ease. Enjoy what little grass there is to chew on here, or fresh green grass, at least, after those rains. Hello, Shannon in Ohio. You would like to know what am I going to miss the most, or do, do I think I even know what I'm going to miss the most when I leave Safari Live? It's a tricky question. Uh, I'm guessing probably the crew. Um, the crew that we have here is, is remarkable. Um, Jean-Ray just clutched his heart and blew me a kiss. Um, <laughs> uh, the crew we have here is really one of a kind. We all get along very well and uh, have a great time here at, at work. It's, it's kind of a holiday place that we work at, which is a lot of fun. Um, of course, the experience, you know, three, two, one, you're live, you're live, is something that's not going to happen again uh, any time in, in the near future. So, so just that, that radio call and, and that sense of knowing that there are thousands of people on the vehicle uh, at any, pos uh, any given moment is, is something that I'm not going to be able to recreate anywhere. And even though I'm really looking forward to the adventures that lie ahead, uh, I'm not going to have all of you guys along with to share those memories with. So that's going to be something that's, that's going to take a lot of getting used to. Um, yeah, so I guess the people, really. Uh, the people involved in, in this experience, you and, and the crew that have become like family to Nikki and myself, uh, are going to be what I miss the most, I think. But let's wait and see, because only time will tell. And I'll be sure to keep you guys updated on where we're going, how we're feeling, what we're doing. <laughs> Meredith, you've mentioned that you'd like your ringtone to be, isn't this awesome? <laughs> and I'm sure there's more than enough archives of that being said. You could have it in all different tones, depending on how exactly you would like to hear it. Lots of youngsters in this herd. It'd be nice to know how many are actually moving through this area. It's impossible to tell due to the thickness of the vegetation, but certainly a sizey herd, I'd say at least 100 members, possibly well more than that. I just want to poke forward, there is an open clearing just up ahead, and I want to see if we can't get some better views of the, the back end of the herd that may still be in that clearing. Morning, Lynn. You would like to know if the female Cape Buffalo are as cantankerous and aggressive as the males. And no, usually, usually not, so they're not going to be as, as much of a threat to us as humans as the males. And interestingly, these large herds, you can actually approach on foot, and they'll actually even approach you. Even if they get an initial fright, they will often recover 
and then come up to, 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 to investigate exactly what you are. So they can be quite inquisitive and, and not nearly as dangerous as the, the old bulls that lurk on their own or in small kind of groups of retirees. Penny in Indiana, you're noticing the barren soils and it's kind of light creamy color you're expecting, richer, darker soils, especially considering there's a lot of animals depositing their manure here. I guess it's the fact that we've had two very dry seasons uh, on top of one another, this being a chronic drought, whereas the one before just being, you know, a dry, drier summer than normal. Um, and it depends on where you are in the Sabi Sands. The, the soil su substrate does dr uh, drastically change depending on where exactly you are. Um, some of the soils are dark black uh, in coloration, not necessarily more nutritious. They're called black cotton soil, that very black soil that you do get in, in the uh, various areas of the reserve, but it's usually not where the roads have been built because that black, black cotton soil acts like a sponge and you don't want to have roads going through any of that soil because when it does rain, it becomes very, very soft and vehicles will just sink into it. Um, but yes, I mean, I hear you, I guess the, the, the Sabi Sands, it does have fairly nutritious soil. The, the surrounding areas are, 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 have great soils and great climate for farming citrus, but not necessarily the most nutritious soil in Africa, I think there are areas where you find far more nutritious soils and abundant growth than the Sabi Sands. So a lot depends on the geology more so than the animals that move through that area. Trust me, when there's sufficient rainfall, this area is lush and plentiful in the summer. The grass would be up to our knees, basically, in this area. It would be a thick, thick carpet. You wouldn't be able to see the ground. We wouldn't be able to see nearly as far as we're seeing now. We're seeing four to five times further into the bush than we would be in a regular summer. It would almost be in a, this road we're driving along now would almost be an impenetrably thick wall of green vegetation from the ground up. This is really not a good example of how lush the summer months can be. And if you want to check that out, I'm sure on YouTube you can search for um, a drive that was taken one year ago from today. So check that out. That'll be worth uh, investigating after after the safari. Go on to 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 any of the, the, the sites and, and, and check out maybe YouTube and, and search for some Safari Live drives from this time last year or even December, January and compare them to the scenes we're seeing now. You'll be horrified. It is nowhere near as lush as it should be. Oh, this is an interesting dwarf mongoose hideout. In the middle of the road, there's a little hole. And let's just wait. I'm sure it won't take long. There we go. There you are. <laughs> and if Jean just zooms out a tiny bit, you'll get an idea of how in the middle of the road it is. There's one tire track on the right of its head and others on the left. <laughs> Living on the edge. Eh? Hey? Okay. And they give this little mongoose an adrenaline rush as we pass over it. Imagine how scary that must be. The sound would be very interesting of the vehicle passing over those little chambers underground. It's 
So we're going to head across to the Arethusa waterhole to see what's happening over there. And still a few minutes before we get there, so while we mosey on, we'll send you back to James for an update. There was a mongoose on top of the den where I put my GoPro, and I was just getting excited when Brian said, Oh, but James, you should have put it closer than that. It's just going to look like we're filming it with a normal camera. And I had to admit that he had a very good point. <laughs> Feeling very depressed and dejected by my mongoose filming efforts today. Safari Dean, a very valid point. In fact, one that I didn't think of and one that I shall certainly consider the next time. Uh, why didn't we get the camera guys to set up the camera? Um, I was busy. I'd be busy filming me, I suppose, but uh, probably because of my fairly large ego, I thought, well, I'll be able to do it. It must be very easy. I mean, how difficult can it be? Apparently very. Okay. Brian, with your superb camera skills, do you think I might... Uh, trouble you to film that purple roller over there. There we go. A purple roller. The least common of the three roller species that we get here. Although I suppose it might be possible to get an even rarer one called a racket-tailed roller. So we get the purple, the European and the lilac-breasted. And they always sit kind of out in the open like that. And that's half for ad advertising territory and half because they can see something to catch on the ground and then fly up to another perch. So there are lots of birds that will do that, like a drongo, for example. But a lot of them will return to the original perch. And sometimes those ones will too. But normally what they'll do is they'll... They, so they sit in that obvious position. They look for, say, a grasshopper. Lots of grasshoppers get eaten by those birds. They'll fly down, grab a grasshopper, and then fly up to a perch close to where they've caught it, and then fly back to another high perch and sit and wait. And that is very distinct behavior from, say... Well, like a drongo, basically, which doesn't catch insects off the ground. It will do both, but it also hawks insects. So it'll take them in the air and then go and sit back. You seldom find a roller taking an insect in the air. It was a scimitable that just flew overhead. they have flown away down towards where my mongoose troop is currently eating my GoPro camera. Ah, I hope. Hello, Brian Jürgensen. You want to know how many species of starling we get here? And you asked this on Twitter. Thank you for your tweet. Um, Brian, we get the Greater Blue-Eared Glossy Starling, the Cape Glossy Starling, the Birchall's Glossy Starling. So those are the uh, three iridescent blue and purple species that we get. Starling. purple violet backed starling and then the other one which is less the least common is the nomadic wattled starling so those are the five species of starling that we get in this area it's possible every so often maybe that a red winged starling might come through the area it's also possible that we might get a lesser blue eared starling if it was really off course from the north of the park um, and those are the I don't think there would be any others that would come through here, no. So, five, potentially, but highly unlikely, seven. Quite a few starling species. It was interesting, the other day I was reading about woodpeckers, and I thought we had quite a lot of woodpeckers here, and apparently we don't. Um, the book that I was reading said that compared with the rest of the world, South Africa is fairly poorly represented uh, by woodpeckers. We've got only four in this particular area. But I know there was a little discussion earlier, I think, about a woodpecker-like bird, which probably comes from the same family, the Picidae. And they get much, a flicker bird or something like that, they get much, much larger uh, in other parts of the world. Now, this was what I thought was the uh, nest of the bush babies. 
I was then told afterwards, no, no, it wasn't that one, actually. Well, it could be a bush baby nest, so it's worth checking. And then the actual bush baby nest, I think, is just up here. Now, Nicola, you've been to the bush baby nest, so when we get past there, I expect you to tell me to stop. Should be on the right-hand side. Should be on the right-hand side here somewhere, close by the road. Now, the bush baby is a little primate, and they nest during the day and come out at night, and they nest in little tree holes. Apparently, Scott did go off the road a little. Could have been in that tree, but that's not a cluster leaf, that's a ZZ fuss. I think I see the tree. He said it was a cluster leaf. Here is a cluster leaf. This tree, perhaps? Okay, what about that one? One there. Behind there. Brian reckons one behind here, maybe. Oh, yes, Brian. In that hole there. Yeah. There's a hole there. Let me go back a bit. There, you can see that dark bit in there is the hole. And we can see vehicle tracks going off the road. Okay, good. So we know which one it is. This is where we will return this evening in order to see if the bush babies come out of there. Good. Thank you, Brian. Well done. Good job. I failed to find that last night, everyone. Oops. That was for Wendy. Wendy, you wanted to see the nest again. I'm not sure if you're with us this morning. But this evening, someone will be able to take you there. Right, I think it's time to go and retrieve my various media devices. Now, Maurice, we had a lovely long discussion about jackals yesterday, and you want to know if we get side-striped jackals here. Yes, we do from time to time, Maurice. You say you heard one calling on the Juma Dam cam. Uh, you, you could well have heard one calling. We do get them. They're not common. In fact, they're very uncommon, but they are found from time to time. And then the other day, we had an amazing sighting of wild dogs and hyenas having a very large and uh, loud spat over some meat. And a blackback jackal, which I haven't seen in this area, I think I've seen one blackback jackal in the Sabi Sands in my entire time here, came trotting in from who knows where, uh, stole a whole lot of the kill, seemingly unnoticed. The dogs and the hyenas didn't react to him at all, and then they just kind of he moved off. It was an amazing sighting to have, and I got really excited to see a blackback jackal. I think they're marvellous creatures. Um, not so much marvellous if you happen to be a sheep farmer in the Karoo, but certainly wonderful entertainment if you're in a wildlife area like this. Here we go. Just getting some info on the mongoose here. So Kimba and Chris Rogue, you've looked up the um, origins or etymology of the word mongoose, and apparently it is a Maharati word. Now, I don't know where Maharati is spoken or, or what, it, what it is. It sounds like it could be um, that I wasn't too incorrect about the Central Asian origin. Goa in India. Thank you, Brian. You may high-five me for that. Thank you very much. And it comes from the word mangas, 
and it was changed in 1698 to mongoose. This is wonderful information. And the plural, as we all know, is mongooses, and seldom mongees. Um, I just tend to use the term mongoose for the plural. My father always used to say mongai, which when I was a small child, I thought very funny indeed. Thank you very much, Chris Rogue, and... And... It's Kimba. Kimba, that's right. Chris Rogue and Kimba, thank you both very much. Mahrati word, mangas, changed in 1698 to mongoose. Let's go back across to Scott. He's at the Arathusa waterhole, and there are some drinking animals there. Well, here we have a medium male impala and a large male impala, both on high alert, having a snooze. Oh, there's an ox picker jumping along one. Well, you'll notice are they trying not to go too deep into that mud. There, there is the risk of animals getting stuck in the mud as they try and reach the receding water lines. But at least these two look like they're safely managing to quench their thirst. And I'm sure the Arethusa waterhole, which is where we are now, is going to be a hive of activity on a hot day like this, which will be wonderful for the guests that have returned from their safaris and can then sit up on their little verandas of their rooms or at the main kind of lodge area that overlooks this large waterhole. Jandre was shocked when he saw how empty it was. He hasn't seen this waterhole since about four months ago, Jandre, I think, when it would have been a lot more full. Two and a half. Two and a half months ago. Um, so it's desperate times out here, and the level of these waterholes is testament to that. Lev in Brooklyn, you are interested to know my thoughts on whether or not animals are ticklish. And the sequence of events that have led you to wonder about this is the way the ox picker that you can see jumping around these impala, you know, it, it investigates some fairly sensitive parts of various animals' anatomies under there. Oh, look at you go. Sure. Now the next one. <laughs> Maybe it's to get the mud out from between their hooves. Well, that was awesome to see them running around like that. Um, I wonder if they are ticklish. I guess they could be. Whether it's the fact that they don't like that intruding feeling of, you know, the ox is digging around their ears and their eyes. So whether it's the intrusion or whether it does Give them a little bit of a, a shiver. I'm not too sure. I think it certainly could be. It's the same as, I guess, it's, it's, it, 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 it feels, you see, you get ticklish and then you get cold shivers. And, and, and it's, they're, they're two different things. Now, I know that I can be ticklish, but I know that sensation of having three flies doing the moonwalk on your face simultaneously. It's not that it makes me ticklish. It, it's, a, it's another sensation. It gives me the, the, you know, the shivers or the chills. Um, so it may be that the buffalo and, and, and the other antelope uh, aren't necessarily ticklish, but they do have this reaction to being crawled upon or hopped upon. I don't know if that made any sense, but, but like I said, it's not that I'm laughing when the, <laughs> when the flies are, 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 are walking around our face, but it certainly does short circuit my nervous system. There have been 
hear some wonderful hypothetical questions this morning. Hello, Shy Me. Uh, I'm told that the YouTube audience is on the, the topic of food at the moment, and you must be discussing one of South Africans' favorite snacks, biltong. And Shy One would like to know if it is basically beef jerky. Yes, it, it, it's jerky, not beef jerky, because you get any manner of biltong, just like you can have any manner of jerky. You can have beef jerky, you can have deer jerky, just like we can have beef biltong, impala biltong, chicken biltong, chicken biltong, ooh, not too sure about that. Fish biltong, mm, terrible. Oh, bacon, bacon biltong, that's amazing. Smoked, tasty. Bacon Bultong, there's a butcher in Hutspray at the town nearby us, and they make really good Bultong, but their Bacon Bultong is one of my favorites. Oh, it's dangerous. So yes, you get all manner of Bultong. You also get a, a sausage form thereof, where essentially uh, the same ingredients that go into Buravorsal, which translates to farm sausage, farmer sausage, which is again, it could be ground up venison, wild game, or ground up beef, often with uh, fat added to that ground up beef, just like you would have in, in most regular sausages, they'll add fat to the mince. Often sheep fat is, is the one that's chosen. And that can be dried, and that's called druevors, so not buravors, but druevors, which means dry sausage as opposed to farmer sausage. And that is just another variation of, of biltong, I guess. That's also tasty. It's quite nice because you don't need to slice it. Um, it's just ready to go. And again, you get many different flavors and ingredients that you can add into any sausage tube. Now my mouth is watering. I'm going to leave all of you with your mouths watering as well. I have heard over the radio waves that the Arethusa guests are going to be spoilt with a bush breakfast this morning on the Arethusa airstrip, which is one of the locations for their bush breakfasts. And we'll take you there for a, a, a quick glimpse of what it looks like from a distance and what those guests are in a treat for. Um, some of you will remember not too long ago, we caught the chef, Dave, he had forgotten something and we saw him racing around, he actually overtook us, racing back to the camp, he had forgotten glasses, so I hope he hasn't forgotten anything today. Anyway, we're going to send you back to James now and we'll call you back across when we have a view of the bush breakfast, which is not too far away from us. Now, you might be interested to know, oh there it is. There is a red-backed shrike in the middle of that bush. Uh, it's an extremely exciting sighting, this, of course. Really astonishing. It's that kind of blobby thing in the middle of the greenery there. That is a female red-backed shrike. Obviously, what else could it be? Now, she was sitting out right in the open as we came across to you, but unfortunately, you can't really see her now. Oh, well, c'est la vie, et cetera, et cetera. There, there's the male. No, don't go back inside. It came right out into the open again. Heinous little bird. It knows we're watching it, you see. So it's doing what it does best, which is hide. There, 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 there. Coming out into the top. There we are. Still do 
not exactly coming out into a confidingly obvious position. But they too, like the swallows, will be thinking about the long journey home. They don't breed here either, the red-back shrike. As far as I'm aware, they breed in Britain. And I'd love for one of our British viewers, perhaps, to tell me, I believe that in Britain, the red-back shrike is just known as the shrike because I don't think you get many different species of shrike there. Anyway, this one is not a particularly friendly one. Just drive around the corner here. They look so different from the males. The males have got that obvious red back. There he is, she is. And a, a sort of bandit's mask over the eye. And you can see the female does not have that. There she is. She's just got a little bit of a mottled chest. She's got a black eye, of course, and a slightly, slightly red back. She's still got the red back. And she and her husband will be heading north for their summer in Europe later on. That's a really nice sighting. Good, well done, Brian. It might be sighting of the day. Mm. I have retrieved my uh, media devices from the go from the mongoose dens. Uh, there were no mongoose there at the time. I suspect quite strongly that we're going to be slightly disappointed with the results, but I'm going to keep trying. And as Brian suggested, the little tripod that I had for the other camera would have been much better suited to the GoPro. Good point. Interesting. Mary Ann, you also said that the mongoose's origin is, comes from India. Mahrati word from Goa, somewhere around there. And you also said that apparently mummified mongoose have been found within the tombs of, of Egypt. It's very interesting. Thank you very much for that, Mary Ann. I know that there were cats, I think, quite often in the tombs of the royalty or the nobility that were mummified. I didn't know about mongoose. Thank you. All right, the heat is building at a great speed now. I think it's going to be a very hot day. So we're going to head for the shelter and hopefully some delicious breakfast of uh, nuts and seeds. Uh, what are you going to have, Brian? I think it's a fry up today. You're going to have eggies. All the bacon, all the eggs. Yeah, before Scott gets back. Mm, very nice. Uh, big thanks to Nikki in the final control and Luisi who is doing the Twitter and emailing and that sort of thing. And thank you to Wendy for your return. Well done. Well done, Brian. There is the thumb. Uh, we are going to see you this afternoon at 4 o'clock. And in the meantime, let us hand you back to Scott Dyson. And he is being filmed, of course, by Jean Ray. Good luck with that one, Scott. See you later. Welcome to the Arethusa Bush Breakfast. Look at how beautiful that scene is. Out in the African wilderness. No. Yeah, we're going to be having a, a tea party up in the air traffic control tower up there a little bit later with Gracie and all of you as well. There's some of the Arethusa staff option. They're all waiting for the guests. You can hear the bright and cheery this morning. And they've done a great job setting up a beautiful, beautiful breakfast spot. Good, we will start making our way back towards camp now. Thank you so much for all of your involvement in the safari. Well done to Nikki for directing the show and to Jandre for documenting it with the camera. We will see you all on the Sunset Safari where hopefully we will find the Inkahuma Pride who are somewhere on Arethusa.